Hi, I'm Naisha McCauley, and you're watching AccessTV.org. <laughs> Morning again. This is Jonathan Small, host and producer of All About You. Uh, this program is again designed to give my guest a chance to give his life, his his or her life story, pretty much. And this program is broadcast every Monday live at AccessTV.org Studios in downtown Hartford. Uh, today, I have a very special guest who's going to share his life story and get into what his new agenda will be. Uh, this person is the former lieutenant governor under the, the Jody Rell administration from 2007 to 2011. He's currently now running for mayor of the city of Stamford. My guest this morning is Michael Fideli. Good morning, Michael. How are you Good morning, doing? Jonathan. How are you? I'm doing fine, and you? Good, thank you. I'm well. Okay. Could you kind of let people know pretty much where did your life get started at? Sure. Uh, in uh, 1958, uh, my parents and I immigrated from... Uh, uh, town uh, in Italy by the name of Marina di Minturno, which is located between uh, about equal distance between Rome and Naples to the city of Stamford. Mm -hmm. uh, my dad uh, and mom basically sold everything they had, left their family, uh, and came across. And, and basically, what they sold, they bought their boat tickets for me, myself, uh, my sister, and my brother, and came to, uh, to Stamford uh, for an opportunity. But, but really, the opportunity was more for what they wanted for their children, an opportunity of of educa better education, the opportunity that they saw that this great state, city, and nation uh, brought for them. Uh, Stanford's been home for me for the last 55 years. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we, when we uh, came to Stanford, uh, we lived in Stanford's west side, and probably for all of my uh, 19 years before I left home, we never moved probably more than a quarter mile from where we landed. We we first came to West Main Street in Stanford and and uh, and lived in a three uh, story apartment uh, across the street from Fatteroli's Chicken Market, mm -hmm. and uh, and then later moved up the street to Mancusi's Hardware Store, and then from Mancusi's we went kind of across the street to Rose Park, mm -hmm. and then from Rose Park ended up on uh, 47 Taylor, which is where uh, I grew up. My parents bought a home, and, uh, and uh, we lived there. And, uh, you know, it was a really neat time. You know, there was neighborhoods. Uh, people uh, were very proud of their homes, uh, their gardens. Uh, you know, it was a traditional Italian neighborhood. You know, it's kind of interesting how uh, these migrations occur. Mm -hmm. uh, my dad, um, in Italy, uh, before he came here, uh, used to make cheese. He, has, he was a cheese fabricator. He made ricotta, mozzarella, all those great okay. things. And uh, unfortunately, when he came to this state, it wasn't a popular item at the time in the 50s. And so he actually went to dig ditches and uh, labor, manual labor for the uh, water company, putting sewers and water lines in through a developing city like the city of Stanford. And my mom uh, used to uh, go to work. She used to walk from where we lived on the west side down to the south end where Harbor Point is occurring mm -hmm. uh, to a company called BNS Lock Company because as many people know Stanford was the lock capital at one time and she used to uh, make uh, locks or hinges for suitcases and briefcases and things like that. So, um, you know, I grew up in an immigrant family so, um, you know, there are great values that, uh, that I bring in my life that have made me and molded me into the person uh, that I am. You know, there's a, there's a great story uh, that my dad used to talk about when we were kids, you know, sitting down around the dinner table was a very important part of our, our world. We, you know, nothing would go on while we were there. And it came out of, during the Second World War, my dad was a prisoner of war. Uh -huh. And there were two things that he vowed he would never do if he ever survived. It was one, stand in line to, uh, to eat. Yes. So we, if we went to a buffet or event, we, one of us would have to get up and make his dish. I think he used that as an excuse though. Okay. And uh, the other one was he would not be rushed through a meal. And so dinner time after he got home from work and washed up was really sitting down and talking. Mm -hmm. And he would tell this great story that I really didn't understand when I was a young man about a loaf of bread. And he, you know, he would say that when we're born that uh, the good Lord gives us a loaf of bread. 
and we travel through our lives with this loaf of bread and that when we meet our spouse or significant other this loaf of bread gets ripped in half and you give half to your spouse and, and, and you carry that other loaf and as you go through life you you give people part of your bread uh, going forward and I always thought as a young man that the real key was that when you passed on to the other, another life wow. that the person with the most bread would win right? Mm -hmm. and it was actually the opposite the person who was left with crumbs really led the life, the life that you know, on the, in the, our next world is really the most important one, and those are things that um, that were very important: uh, public service, helping our neighbors, as we were helped when we came off the boat in the, in New York City uh -huh. um, to this new world. You know, there were there were people from our village, people who had already settled here, who sh showed us things that were important, uh, simple things, and uh, uh, it was a great time. Okay. We talked off the air about baseball, and <laughs> this past week, this whole Jackie Robinson movie sure. is coming up. And you grew up in the West End, was it the West End? The West, we call it West Side, West End, West, West Side. Side. Yeah. Uh, did Jackie Robinson live in the West Side, or was that the North? No, uh, Jackie lived in the West Side, but you know, I'm really proud of, of uh, what Jackie Robinson meant to Stanford and, and actually what he did, not only to baseball, but with the whole uh, African American community right across the street from my office, which I happened to relocate to Stanford's West Side, okay. uh, is Jackie Robinson Park. Now, it wasn't known as that. It was known as Greenfield maybe 15, 20 years ago. Uh -huh. And when I was on the board of the Yearwood Center, which used to be my old elementary school, um, we thought it'd be great to turn that into something uh, that was memorable for a gentleman like Jackie Robinson, who did so much for the community. And uh, it, it, this last year, uh, it has been redeveloped. There's a statue of Jackie Robinson yeah. sitting there. I don't know if you saw that. I uh, did see and that. And that, that park did not look like that uh, when, uh, when I first moved uh, my headquarters operation to 192 Richmond. Uh, and so I'm so very proud of not only uh, being part of what has occurred there, mm -hmm. but also the importance that Jackie Robinson uh, it, uh, you know, created f and uh, what he did for not only for, as I said, for baseball, but for all our community, kind of bridging that gap and making us all aware that we are all one people. Mm -hmm. Well, he's a national hero, really, not just a local hero mm -hmm. for what he stood for, what he would fought against at that particular time. Mm -hmm. uh, does his wife actually still live in Stanford? No, I oh. believe she, actually, I was reading an article about it this week. I think she's like 91. I think she lives in Norwalk. So I oh. think they moved a couple of a couple of cities up the line, but uh, I remember growing up as a young man uh, how uh, uh, how impressed we were because they used to do jazz concerts uh, at their they used to open up their home once a year for a fundraiser and they would do jazz concerts on the lawn. I was too young, didn't drive, to be able to go, but I remember reading about them and hearing about them. And then uh, once they moved uh, to uh, Norwalk, those those did not go on anymore. Mm -hmm. What did you do after graduating high school? What was your next level to uh, pursue? Well, I graduated high school. I went to West Hill High School uh -huh. and I uh, graduated in class of 1973. We were the first graduating class. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, Governor Malloy and I were graduating uh, classmates uh, oh, okay. in that class. And um, I went on to, at, this, at the time, we had uh, in our community college system here in the state, we also had technical colleges, which have since merged into the community college system. And um, uh, I went to New York State Technical College and I wanted to get into computers. Now, when I speak of computers in the 70s, I'm talking about punched cards. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you did a program, you'd sit there at the key punch machine and load these cards into a reader. And I did that. And then from there, I went on to uh, Fairfield University. Okay. Uh, and uh, really, gradu you know, when I, when I got out of uh, school, uh, I was a computer science major mm -hmm. and uh, really just worked for uh, two... Uh, public companies, uh, the last one being a very small battery company called Duracell, uh -huh. um, and uh, uh, they grew to a big company while, while I was there, and uh, was given the opportunity to uh, start my own business, uh -huh. uh, and I started that with a, a telephone book and a, a telephone, and my wife keeps reminding me that people probably don't know what a telephone book is anymore because right. everybody's online looking right. at stuff, but sitting there dialing for dollars like many businesses start. And, uh, you know what we do today in my business and what we did back then is night and day we you know like the dinosaur we've had to evolve from punch card systems to digital media mobile media and technology the internet but um, I started the business and we've grown it uh, into nine 
offices throughout uh, the uh, the U.S. Uh-huh. Uh, we're about 100 employees, okay. and we do a lot of uh, security work in the uh, internet uh, computer space for. Uh, large to medium companies. Mm-hmm. Now, everybody know you as the former lieutenant governor here on a statewide level in mm-hmm. um, Connecticut, and you also are a business owner. Mm-hmm. Uh, what kind of led you into the political world? Well, um, I was sitting uh, around the dinner table. There's a lot of happens at our dinner table, good food and good conversation. Mm-hmm. And my, uh, my son, Michael, uh, was um, I think four or five years old, uh, maybe three years old. And my daughter, do- my daughter Brianna, was one. Mm-hmm. And we were, I was reading the newspaper, reading about the Board of Education and some of the decisions that were being made. And my father-in-law was involved in Republican politics at the time. And I made some comment about how what a stupid decision that was, and, and why I felt that way. Mm-hmm. He said, "Boy, do I have a something you, you should try?" So I went to this thing called a town committee meeting. Uh, Republican town committee meeting, and um, you know, was something I would say about outspoken, but clearly shared my thoughts on what I thought was going on. And, and next thing I knew, in, in uh, I think 1987, I, I was running for the board of representatives, which was our version of the town council. Mm-hmm. And I served there for for two years, and then went back to my business. This is all going on while I'm trying to build a business build and business. raise a family with my wife and the whole deal, uh, and uh, left there. Went back to my business, and then in uh, 92, uh, ran, which was the second half of the Weicker administration. The first half, they uh, had implemented the income tax. I was somewhat outspoken about that. Right. And 92 ran for the General Assembly and, and represented the 147th district, for, uh, with, that was the northern part of Stanford, and a portion of New Canaan, Connecticut, uh, here in the legislature for 10 years. And uh, uh, used to drive up every day from Stanford to here. and. Mm-hmm. Uh, Spent uh, 10 years there and uh, left as a uh, system minority leader. Uh, went back to my business in, in 2002, was doing my thing, and I got a call from uh, Governor Rell. Mm-hmm. Uh, and she was looking for a, uh, uh, a running mate for lieutenant governor uh, and, uh, you know, was looking for someone with my background, a, a, you know, business background, entrepreneurial background someone who had uh, the legislative experience who could understand the process and quite frankly knew some of the characters on on the in the other side of the aisles on both sides of the aisle since i've already been there and really brought a life story uh that was very keen and important to that and uh, uh ran in 2006 when we won mm-hmm. uh and served four years as a lieutenant governor which was uh, you know something looking back you know as a young man coming off a of a journey over the Atlantic Ocean at uh, three years old that, you know, I'm sure my parents and I never thought uh, I would ever uh, be in a position to be the number two guy in the state of Connecticut. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, a few months ago, I had the current Lieutenant Governor Nancy Wyman Mm -hmm. on as a special guest, and she said people might underestimate the position as a Lieutenant Governor Mm -hmm. that, you know, you're just a side, well, not a side, a kick for the governor, but there's a lot of responsibilities that you have to do as a, a lieutenant governor. Uh, do you feel it's a very, pre- not, not just a very prestigious job, but is it a very responsible, demanding job as a lieutenant, a governor? You know, jobs are what you make them. Okay. Um, there are a lot of folks that think that the lieutenant governor position is an empty suit. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're absolutely wrong, uh, particularly as it relates to me. Okay. Uh, I, uh, you know, one of the, Key two is really two key responsibilities by constitution that you have to do uh, before they fire you, right? One mm-hmm. is you have to be the president mm-hmm. uh, of the Senate when they're in session, and I was there all the time. In fact, people were amazed I never went to the restroom while I was standing there for 12 hours at times. Okay. Uh, secondly, um, the uh, second thing is if the governor's out of state, you are the governor. Mm-hmm. Uh, you have all the powers that are given to the governor. You are you are the fill-in, okay? Everything else is what I call whiteboard. And in my whiteboard, we did economic development. Mm-hmm. Okay, we did education reading programs. Uh, we went out and uh, met ships, uh, the new port that opened up in New London, greeting those people because that's economic development. You know, people look at this as well. That's pretty cheesy. You're meeting a big ocean liner. Well, you know what? There were hundreds of people that came off that boat that spent money in our community in our state that added to the bottom line. Mm-hmm. Uh, I worked with the Tourism Bureau. It's what you make of the job, and you know I really uh, made a lot of that job. And a lot of people were very surprised because I would come up here every day. Mm-hmm. I didn't have to, 
Yes. You know, ba based on the Constitution, but I did because I thought that was very important. I thought it was very important also to be uh, to be part of, of the decision making process. So uh, I think anyone who who thinks at least when I served as lieutenant governor that it was not a real thing really should go back and look at the videotapes because uh, they would be very surprised with the work that we did do. Now, when you are a lieutenant governor, do you get a chance to implement or suggest any particular proposals on sure. a statewide level? Absolutely. You, you, you are, uh, again, in the relationship that I had with the governor, uh, I was at the table uh, in talking about implementation. I was, for instance, uh, the chair of the criminal justice information system. Uh, if you recall, uh, there was an instance where some people were released uh, out of jail without the proper uh, uh, clearance, and that was because if you look at, at the time in our criminal justice system, there were so many different silos that people went from uh, getting out of corrections to parole and things of that nature. I headed that up because of my IT background. Mm -hmm. uh, I was put on the first part of what is called the health exchange today, uh, early on when health, national health care came around uh, and worked on that. Um, we talked about budgets. I can tell you there are many times we didn't agree. Mm -hmm. uh, there are many times I said, well, that's not what I would do, but you know, at the end of the day, the governor mm -hmm. proposes and the legislature votes it in, right? Um, but no, I, I feel that uh, I was, I was uh, allowed to, uh, to give my input and to sometimes it was taken and sometimes it wasn't. But I mean, that's part of the exchange in any job, mm -hmm. right? Your boss is not always going to agree with you. On the other hand, if you have a good boss, they're sometimes going to agree with you. Well, you have to have a good working relationship with your boss as the governor. Mm -hmm. I mean, people don't have to like each other, mm -hmm. but I guess if you're working with somebody, you have to have a level of uh, respect mm -hmm. with that person and mm -hmm. confidence and believe that, mm -hmm. you know, you and this person can work as mm -hmm. a team. Because I guess it's more like a team effort yep. when you're the lieutenant governor and the right. governor. Right. Um, you never thought after the, the administration ended and we had a new governor to decide, I guess, currently to look at running for governor or you just you know Jonathan um, as I said earlier in the program um, public service has never been a stepping stone for me I mean you could look at some folks in our state and you could see kind of that you know, I want to get this job and this job and this job and just lead, lead me up mm -hmm. that's never been from what I why I did it I've done it because I felt I've always could lead something to the conversation and okay. clearly are some folks who believed that um, I was going to run for governor again this this cycle, and uh, really hadn't decided one way or the other uh, when uh, Mayor Pavia uh, agreed decided I should say uh, that he was not going to run uh, for mayor. Uh, I thought about it. I looked at the folks who had announced at the time, and I looked at the opportunities, the challenges, and this being my home. Stanford's mm -hmm. been my home for. 55 years for me and my family, and it's given us the opportunity of who we are as, as people and gave my family that opportunity. And I thought uh, that uh, this would be an incredible opportunity for me to kind of put my uh, handprint on uh, Stanford as we move into the 21st century. Mm -hmm. Well, you're running now for mayor of Stanford uh, mm -hmm. this up and coming on November. Mm -hmm. And Stanford has a strong mayor form of government, mm -hmm. so you will have a lot of authority mm -hmm. if you become mayor. Um, is this another challenge in your life now to pursue to be the mayor of Stanford? Well, I guess you could call it a challenge, right? Mm -hmm. Because anything new is can be because they're a challenge. But I think you know what I bring to that position uh, is not something that I think any of the other candidates bring, and that's not blowing my own horn, right? Mm -hmm. If you look at it from a resume perspective, who would you want? to run uh, uh, as a CEO of a city or, or a town. Someone who obviously clearly understands the legislative and uh, political process, right? Someone who uh, is an entrepreneur, business guy, understands budgets and managing and bringing people. And clearly someone who has the, pro probably the life experiences that I have, right? Um, you know, I wasn't born with a silver spoon in my mouth. Mm -hmm. um, you know, came here as an immigrant. I'm a naturalized American, so I understand the issues that immig immigrants in our town, in our state, and in our nation face as they're trying to raise their family and moving forward. And and I think you take all that and you say, well, wh where could you find such a candidate? Well, here I am. Yeah. I'm someone who has served not only at the municipal level in our board of representatives, so I understand local government, uh, someone who is understands the legislature because I served for 10 years in the General Assembly. 
I understand the executive branch. I served for four years in the executive branch, so I know how to interact with those all those issues, along with mayors and selectmen and other boards and other towns, all 169 of them. Um, I'm an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. I started a, a business and been successful at it for 30 years. And uh, I mean, my life story, I mean, you know, uh, is, is what it is. Uh, it's made me the person that I am. So you take all that, and I think I've got the tools in my toolkit to take uh, to, to go into office and do a great thing for Stanford to, to take on that challenge uh, because it's not on the job training. Okay, mm -hmm. um, you know, I have done things. For instance, you know, we, we've all been hit with uh, issues of uh, the storms, uh, Sandy and Irene that came through here, snowstorms. Yes. Well, as mayor, that's one of the key important things that you have to do emergency management. I've done that, I've done that at a state level. Mm -hmm. I've done that We're trying to coordinate with 169 towns, be it floods, be it hurricanes, be it so snowstorms. So if, God forbid, something like that happens, I'm prepared to deal with that, not only relative to the, the management of the city, but in working with our partners at the state and federal level to get the resources we need to get there. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm familiar with budgets. You know, as, as lieutenant governor in our administration, I think the total combined budget was like $36 billion, $34 billion, 56,000 employees. Granted, Stanford is not that big. I think it's with the Board of Education, maybe uh, five hundred million dollars and uh, a couple thousand employees. Point is, I've been there. Okay, mm -hmm. it's not like I'm I'm going to be baking the cake and saying, well, what do I put in this recipe right now? I know how to bake the cake. I know the ingredients that go into it. I know how to pick a good management team because I've done that not only uh, in my in my political career but also in my business experience. Okay. Well, you know, I, in 2011, uh, endorsed actually my executive one producer who was running for mayor here in Hartford. Mm -hmm. And I felt that he was the right person, if elected, that could really make some dramatic changes. But the major problem that this city and maybe a lot of other cities throughout the country are experiencing is a high voter apathy. Mm -hmm. um, Stanford doesn't seem to have a major problem with the residents not voting, or is that an issue? Well, Stanford, you know, again, everybody comes out in the presidential, right? Right. Uh, as part of a candidate, it's your job to get your vote out, right? And sometimes that vote comes out. But I think you have to create that excitement, mm -hmm. right? You have to uh, say, hey, you know, if you don't get out to vote, if you don't do this, I may not be win. I may not win, and guess what? That opportunity is lost, and we can't implement our vision. Right? Mm -hmm. um, it's difficult. It's difficult in the urban centers. Um, you know, um, uh, one of the reasons I got involved in politics, as I said earlier, is because I didn't want to be on, on the sidelines. Yes. I didn't want to say, "Oh, that guy fumbled the ball." Mm -hmm. You know, he made a bad pass. I wanted to be in there carrying the ball. I wanted to be the person throwing the ball. Okay, mm -hmm. so that we could move towards the goalpost. Right? Unfortunately, there's still a lot of that still going on. Uh, in, in our country, not let alone our state, I think it's behooving upon uh, the candidate to excite their base. It's behooving upon the candidate to excite everyone in the city to say, uh -huh. look at our vision, look at what we can do together, working together. You know, our system of government um, forces us to run in parties, uh -huh. right? It's, we can't, you know, just run as an individual. Um, but after you get elected, there's no longer Republicans, Democrats, unaffiliated people who don't vote. It's the citizens of Stanford, uh -huh. right, working together. And it's my job as mayor to go in there and find the best people who have the best qualification to serve on boards and commissions, to to work with me to implement their vision, okay? I don't have all the answers. I'm not afraid to say that, yes. okay? But I'm willing to roll up my sleeves and work with people in a cooperative manner to move it forward. Well, I mean, your city, if you check the data, Mm -hmm. of the past maybe 10 mayoral elections, is the numbers kind of uh, adequate or is it low or is it high? Well, what, what are the Stanford, Stanford, I mean, from a Republican perspective, mm -hmm. mirrors the national and state trend. You know, the Republicans are the third minority, it's the minority party. Mm -hmm. You have on affiliates and then you have Democrats and then you have Republicans. So as a Republican, I've always had to not only get the Republican vote, but I've had to get Democrats and affiliates to like me, yes. right? Um, and I think, you know, as I said earlier, if you look at my resume, mm -hmm. right, if you look at what I bring, I think people say, well, you know what, this gentleman is not a Republican. He's really just like us. Yes. Okay? And I think in a general election, um, I, I do very well in that field because it's not, you know, so hard-hitting. It's got to be this way. It's a blending of so many different ideologies, very centric uh, uh, and I think people like that in the candidate. 
Mm -hmm. Now, if you become elected mayor of Stanford, <clears throat> what is one of the biggest challenges that you would have to address? In well, first, um, I think the uh, there's a there's a multitude of them, but clearly education. You uh -huh. know, people look at Stanford and they say, "Wow, what a well-to-do city, right?" With uh -huh. the, this incredible grand list and stuff. But yet we have this educational gap, and uh -huh. yet we have a, a great university, we have the University of Connecticut, right in downtown. Yes. Right. So how do we get our students to bridge this gap? Number one, and then how do we make this great university system that surrounds us? available to our students as they graduate there. Uh -huh. And as as mayor, I sit as the ex-officio ex officio on the Board of Education. So that means I could attend the meetings, comment, but I can't vote. Uh -huh. uh, I plan on attending those meetings. I plan on working with the superintendent. I plan on working with the administration. I plan on working with the teachers and the parent PTOs uh, to talk about the challenges and issues that we have in Stanford and how we can help bridge that gap to make all our kids uh, uh, Attend higher education or uh, the reopening of Wright Tech, which is a, a, a right te they call it a technical school, but also to you know, not everyone's is geared towards and channeled to colleges, but to bring them into that school system. So, so, so education uh, is a is a big component. Uh -huh. Uh, clearly continuing at the economic development, creating jobs uh -huh. uh, for our citizens uh, and maintaining the quality of life that we've, we're going accustomed to. You know, we've got a great uh, parks project going on right now that we're going to do a ribbon cutting in the beginning of May, the Mill River Greenway uh, uh -huh. that's in downtown. Uh, we have incredible shoreline. You know, uh -huh. we have such such gems and assets. We have a great downtown that's uh -huh. uh, by far none. Uh, we've uh, the folks who who vi had that vision have done a great job with it. Uh, people, when they leave work or on weekends, want to be in downtown Stanford. They don't want to leave and go to the suburbs, right? Mm -hmm. So um, all those things are going for us. But if when th some things can change, it can go the other way. And I think uh, it's very important as uh, as mayor that you cre you create a balance which says here are the needs of the city and how we address them, and here's what we can afford to pay, mm -hmm. and balance that out. Well, I was there yesterday. I took a little trip down to Stanford, mm -hmm. and I didn't spend the whole day down there, but I kind of got an idea of what the city is like. And it seems like to me in life, you're only as good as your weakest link. Mm -hmm. And I don't know clearly a portion of what you know about the city, but the certain areas like the West End or the East Side seems to be a little bit on the neglected side. You mm -hmm. don't see their gated homes. You don't mm -hmm. see the businesses. At least I didn't see. Mm -hmm. And you kind of cleared it up to me that there that there are some businesses in the West uh, End or mm -hmm. the West Side. I keep getting at yep, mixed okay. up. Okay, um, to get businesses and companies to go where you don't have the level of economic development that other parts of the city exists. Mm -hmm. How, as a mayor, would you be able to strategize that type of plan? Well, if, if, to your point, uh, there are task forces currently going on on the east side uh, and the west side looking at what you're talking about. You know, how do we, how do we improve uh, housing? How do we improve economic development? You know, uh -huh. I mentioned earlier, uh, we have UBS, uh, Swiss, the old Swiss bank. Uh -huh. uh, Royal Bank of Scotland, which are in Stanford's west side. Uh -huh. They may not be prominent, prom primarily right in the center of it, yes. but they're on the fringe of it, not very far from Jackie Robinson Park, okay. right up right up the hill from that. Um, so that's some of that's going on there, but it's really trying to create um, that economic development, those jobs, while still maintaining their neighborhoods. You know, Stanford, one of the neat things about Stanford, I'm not sure if you saw it when you were down there, but we have, we're a city, but we're a town within a city. Uh -huh. You can go to Springdale, you can go to Glenbrook, you can go to North Stanford, the West Side, the East Side, uh, the South End, all those areas, and there's a uniqueness to those neighborhoods uh -huh. uh, that we've been able to carry along. So the balance in when we're looking at redevelopment of these areas is to create an environment where, yes, you continue to grow the city in a balanced fashion, but maintain the uniqueness of who we are in those neighborhoods and who we are in those people. You go to the local diner, you uh -huh. know, it's the same folks every morning sitting there having their cup of coffee, right, reading the newspaper. That's And they talk about the local issues that are going on in not only the city and town, but within their neighborhood, uh -huh. right? Uh, I think that's very special uh, for Stanford. The South End, 
with Harbor Point. I mean, as a, you know, that was Pitney Bowes, uh, and a highly, uh, Yale, the old Yale in town. It was a highly industrial, uh, abandoned in some cases area. Mm -hmm. Uh, we've now seen, uh, development occur there. Now, one could argue, uh, as they did during urban redevelopment in the 60s, is it the right developments, is the balanced development? The point is, there's development going on there. Housing's being provided, there are retail, there's restaurants, there's uh, there's jobs, uh, uh, Starwoods International moved their, their headquarters down there, there are a bunch of hedge, fund, hedge funds that have moved there. So that's the kind of stuff, and, and unfortunately, uh, being impatient as we are as human beings, mm -hmm. we'd love to say, Shazam, and it's all done, right? Yeah. You can't do that. It, it takes time and takes planning, master planning. But I think one of the the, the uh, uniquenesses of Stanford is its location, mm -hmm. thanks to the Ice Age in Manhattan, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the rail, mm -hmm. the highways, and uh, the uh, education uh, that's there, the, the pool of resources. We have to make sure that that pool continues to grow, because mm -hmm. obviously, it's one thing saying I want to move to a location, but where's my workforce going to come from? Yes. Right. So we as a city have to be prepared to provide that workforce. We as a city have to be prepared to provide the infrastructure to get people to and from work. We as a city have to provide the public safety component. We have to provide the uh, quality of life, and we have to afford the provide the affordability of housing mm -hmm. uh, that comes with that. Um, all those are, you know, easily said than done, done yes. but it is a balance. It's, you know, putting the right mixtures into the recipe, to hopefully come, come out with that. Can that be done in four years? I, I wish I could say yes, I, but I think you can get started and getting it done because this is, it is a pretty big task. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I go to the Caribbean and Stanford kind of reminds me a little bit of Kingston, Jamaica, mm -hmm. so... Mm -hmm. Cosmetology and city. You have a lot of different neighborhoods. You have some tremendous areas of of, of uh, influences, and you have a lot to see and do. You know, Sunday I was down there yesterday. People was downtown. People was in the parks. Mm -hmm. um, picked a beautiful day to be there. Picked a beautiful yeah. day. I wish I could say the same thing about this city, Hartford. Mm -hmm. I mean, our downtowns are just not thriving on the weekends. Mm -hmm. So you're right. You do have a lot going for you. So you see, like to me, if you take this, when you, if you get this position, you kind of have a better sense of confidence that I know mm -hmm. exactly what the city has going for mm -hmm. it and what I need to do to maintain it. I'm not trying to hope that we get this or get that. You have a lot already right. on the but, table. But, but we, you have to be careful mm -hmm. in any office that that doesn't create complacency, mm -hmm. right? That you don't sit there and say, "Why well, this life is great. Let's just have some more coffee." Right. Every day you have to challenge yourself and say, "What do we need to do? How can we be better?" Right. Right. I mean, just it's no different than you as a human being. You know, mm -hmm. you can say, "Wow, what a great person I am. I've just done this." But we know we have faults, and how can we be better? Mm -hmm. Right. That's the same question you have to ask yourself as mayor. What can I be doing better to help our citizens? Is every child passing the CMT? The answer is no, then it's never complete until every child can pass the CMT. Is that possible? I don't know. We're going to try, though. Okay. Um, how do we make our downtown safe? I mean, one of, I remember when I was on the Board of Representatives, as I said, I represented the northern part of the, of the, uh, of the city. Mm -hmm. We don't have sidewalks there. Mm -hmm. And we were looking for a million dollars in our budget for community policing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember my constituency says, well, Jesus, you know, why are we spending a million dollars? We don't have any sidewalks in the north side of town. Mm -hmm. And I said, the million dollars is not for policing in the north part of town. It's for the downtown. Because if you create a downtown that is safe, mm -hmm. if you create a downtown that people feel comfortable in being in, everything else is going to occur. People are going to want to go and open restaurants and theaters and uh, revitalize park and put retail where they feel safe. Uh, if you do not feel Feel safe if you uh, don't want to be eating outside in uh, in an open air environment because you feel someone's going to come by and shoot you or something like that. You're not going to eat there. Mm -hmm. So those investments need to be made, and I think one of the biggest mistakes we could possibly make, not only as a city but as a nation, is rest on our laurels and our complacency. And I think um, we can make Stanford better, and I'm going to try to do that in four year terms. That four year term that I'm mayor there.
Okay, Governor Malloy is considering eliminating the car tax, mm -hmm. and Stanford, I believe, gives two hundred million dollars a year. Is that number accurate or that? No, no I think the number is way high. Way think, high, yeah, okay. but it's still a big number. I think it's about twenty million dollars. Twenty million. I got it mixed up. Yeah, it's, twenty. It's not still, it's million. still a okay. big. Yeah, remember the zero to decimal yeah, yeah, point yeah, yeah, story. Yeah, okay. <laughs> but it's still a big number. Twenty million dollars is a lot of money. Okay. Yeah. Would you be in favor of having that? You know, it's kind of it's kind of funny when I look at that proposal. In the Rell administration, we proposed doing the exact same thing, mm -hmm. except we were going to hold the towns harmless. We were going to give them back the money. Okay. So we were going to eliminate it as a as a tax to you as an individual, which is what you wanted us to do. But we were not going to penalize the towns. The legislature voted down. Mm -hmm. So now you have the same proposal, the same exact proposal, but he's not. The governor's not giving you the money. Guess where that proposal's going? Mm -hmm. Nowhere. Nowhere. Look. I think uh, it's a trickle-down effect, right? I understand state budgets. Mm -hmm. I understand municipal budgets. I understand what the governor's trying to do. Uh, but you can't put it on the backs of the municipalities. You can't put it on the backs of hospitals. There's a current hospital tax that's paid now. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, he's looking to eliminate uncompensated care. If he does that, and as I, uh, I alluded to earlier, I'm on the vice chair of the board uh, of directors for Stanford Hospital, a major medical facility in our area. Mm -hmm. We believe that there will be a number, a number of hospitals that will be going bankrupt in this in this city, mm -hmm. in the state. So you got to look at the effect of that. You just can't pass the buck on to someone else because if we lose that $20 million, there are only two th two options available to a municipality, unlike to the state where they can get money from other places, uh, is you either cut your spending, which is a big cut, or you raise taxes. Mm -hmm. And right now, I think our citizens have had enough of people raising taxes and dipping into their wallet. The more money we take from you, the worse it's for you. I think you can do better things with your own money than I can with your money, right? Mm -hmm. Cutting services, nobody wants to do that, right? Yeah. We, in fact, if anything, we need more and more uh, services for some folks to get them up and working and getting on with their lives. So uh, I'm not in favor of, well, I'm pretty, well it's a two-step answer. Mm -hmm. I'm in favor of eliminating the car tax, but I'm not in favor of not funding it for the municipalities. Okay. You have to have a good working relationship with the governor. Mm -hmm. um, now, Stanford is a city that's not usually like New Haven, Bridgeport, and Hartford and some of your other urban cities that look for a lot of state aid, usually your city is giving a lot of money back to mm -hmm. the state. Um, do you feel confident that you have a good working relationship with our current governor if you become mayor? Absolutely. As I said, uh, you know, when, uh, from my perspective, after the election, there's no longer labels. We are one people working together. Uh, as Stanford goes, so goes the region, and quite frankly, the, 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 key, the money that we kick up here, right? Mm -hmm. However, Stanford does need money, okay? okay? Mm -hmm. We still have a large uh, population of children, for instance, that are on the uh, free lunch program, mm -hmm. okay? People would say, in Stanford? Yes. Of course, yes, uh, in Stanford, you know, we have these disparities, and that's my job as mayor, okay, is to make sure we can bridge those disparities, to help people get a better education and to do better on their testing, to be able to go get a better and get going to higher education to create jobs of all types so that people can work and stay and provide for their family that's really the key and working with the governor working with our congressional leadership to bring federal dollars and to improve our rail system to increase our roads it's not there's no boundaries I guess my point is is you roll up your sleeve and say you know what's what's the benefit here and how do I uh, how do I work with state government and federal government to get it for me I've got a leg up on everybody on that. Remember, I was in the legislature, so uh -huh. I know what goes on there. Uh -huh. I was in the executive branch. I know what goes on the other side of the desk, right? Yeah. So, you know, um, you know, I can look people in the eye and say, really? Uh -huh. You know, um, and I hope that we can work together. Uh, you know, as I said, Governor Malloy and I, have, I think, have a great respect for each other. We, we uh, graduated high school together, um, and uh, I've always had a, a good working relationship. Uh -huh. uh, he did a lot for the city when he was mayor, mm -hmm. um, Harbor Point started under his administration. Mm -hmm. That's one of the largest um, private 
um, what they call private De um, development. investment. Yep, okay. private development, development, investment, yep. Yes, in the country, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, you say never rest on your laurels. You mm -hmm. know, you always want to continue to make things better. Um, let's just say, for instance, I had some international contacts, and I said in Trinidad they have a lot of oil and gas, and I would like to establish a level of international trade mm -hmm. to come into Stanford. You're very close to JFK Airport. Mm -hmm. um, how would I go about working? Do I have to go through you, or do I have to go through the Economic Development Board? How does the mayor fit the, into well, that? Well, mayor, the mayor's office has a director of economic development in Stanford. Okay. Okay. Uh, we work where we work hand in hand with. The state economic development again, depending on what your needs were, right? Okay. If you were looking for t uh, issues relative to state issues that need to be, we would work in with you in conjunction with the state Department of Economic Community Development as a, as a group. If it was just Stanford driven and and this is where you wanted to be, we would we would work with you directly, right? Uh -huh. So, and I guess that's what I'm saying. It's a partnership. It's a team, right? There's no I in team. You bring everything together for the betterment of of who. Uh, what you're trying to accomplish. And at the end of the day, you're trying to accomplish economic development, you're trying to accomplish jobs, and so on, right? Uh -huh. uh, and Stanford, if, if that fits for your needs, is the way you're doing it. That's how development occurs. The South End, yes, there's a lot going on there. Uh, there's more that can go on there. I think any development that occurs, irrespective of where it occurs, has to be balanced, right? So you have to look at, okay, what is it that we're trying to accomplish, and how do you get there and still create an environment that people will enjoy? For instance, there's a, a, a beautiful boardwalk that has been created as part of the South End project, right? You know, uh, how do you balance those so that on a nice sunny day, uh -huh. uh, people can go there, right? If there, is there a park as part of that, that master plan? So there's a lot of that that goes into this. Uh, there is, you know, a lot of time to, to go in, into that aspect of economic development. The good news for any company looking to come to Stanford, there's a number of different ways you can get there. Okay. Um, basically, your city can be labeled as an international city to some degree because you're still close to New York City, which is one mm -hmm. the largest city in the country. Mm -hmm. And that international level of different nationalities kind of makes your city kind of diversify. Mm -hmm. You know, people are not like Greenwich or New Canaan where you just see one ethnic race mm -hmm. and you are a, a Republican. And historically, the African Americans and now the Latinos are just labeled or locked into the Democratic mm -hmm. Party system. Um, as a Republican, how do you start to show? Because you're going to need, obviously, the mm -hmm. Democrats and the unaffiliated mm -hmm. voters. How do you start to show them that the Republican Party has more to offer? Because really, you're going to be competing. Is that something mm -hmm. that you would look into? Yeah, Michael Fideli has a lot to offer them. Okay, that's I'm not a label. Right. Uh, I run as a Republican because that's how our, our system is set up. Right? Okay. But I can talk to Latinos because I'm an immigrant. Right. I remember when uh, I was lieutenant governor, I spoke to a chamber of commerce of Latino owners, uh, uh, business owners. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I was dressed up in my fancy suit and uh, stood in front of these folks and said, what do you and I have in common? You would have thought that they would have Googled me. Or something, right? To see it, and, and they kind of looked at me like, "Man, we really don't. We're not sure." Mm -hmm. And I said, "Well, we have everything in common. We are both naturalized citizens. Yes, we, we just came from different geographies. English was a second language. Mm -hmm. Okay, so all of those things. My parents worked hard doing jobs that they weren't trained for to provide for their family. Mm -hmm. They wanted the best education for their children, so on and so forth." So there is a lot in common. Forget the Republican label, the Democratic label. Uh -huh. I can talk to you. Tell me about English as a second language. Tell me about the challenges your child's having in school. I had those. Uh -huh. Tell me about the desire to be someone in this country. I've been there. Uh -huh. And I stand before you as a, an example of that American dream. Blacks. I was part of 1969 of segregation. I was one of three white people uh, on the bus. Mm -hmm. I learned things on that bus that you can never learn in school, mm -hmm. okay? Um, I never looked at someone by their skin color. Mm -hmm. I never, I always gave uh, who I was and that person uh, the relationship that we had based on who we were as people. Mm -hmm. um, and those things were never uh, uh, critical importance to me. So um, I, I grew up in that environment. Mm -hmm. So. When um, I 
work with people. I go beyond that. I remember uh, as Lieutenant Governor, uh, there's a soup kitchen uh, not far from Jackie Robinson Park uh, by, put on by New Covenant House. Mm -hmm. And on Wednesdays when I was in town, my wife would always volunteer there on Wednesdays and I would go and help her on Wednesdays. And uh, there were people of all races, and so actually some with shir shirts and ties and jackets, uh -huh. that this was one meal that they were going to try to save on, and they would be in line at the new uh, Covenant House. And I remember people would, would come up to me and say, Lieutenant Governor, I want to own a home. I want to send my kids to school. Can you help me? And I truly believe that most people in need in this world are not looking for a handout, but a hand up. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes in government we get those two confused. Right. We want to create a system of dependency mm -hmm. instead of a system, a system of assistance. And so as mayor, I, I would reach out to all those constituencies, people that whom people would say would normally not vote for me, mm -hmm. and say, what I can do is give you a hand up and work with you uh -huh. to get you out of the system of dependency. Because I've been in some areas that you've been. I've experienced what you've been. I've experienced discrimination. Uh -huh. Okay? I've been labeled because of who I am and who I was. Yes. Okay? You may not see that looking at me right. today, uh -huh. right? but I've been there. Uh -huh. um, so you can't take that away from me just because I am who I am today. Uh -huh. Well, I mean, it's real important that you clarify the difference between you, Michael Fideli, as the individual, what you can do, and not the party system. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, the party system seems to draw a lot of clout. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm not saying a mayoral election is the same as the past mm -hmm. um, govern or the past national mm -hmm. election, where the Republicans are saying they got to start to reach out for African Americans and Latinos because they're losing that voting block. Mm -hmm. Um, hopefully, in your case, you know, your city can be a little bit different. Um, but the democratic system is known as, as a dependency, as that safety net. Mm -hmm. And the Republican system is known to try to help people help themselves. But there is a lot of misconceptions that people sure. have about both parties. Mm -hmm. There's some people who believe the Republican side wants to eliminate everything and turn back our country. And some people say the Democratic side wants to continue bleeding our country with all of these social programs. Mm -hmm. Is that a misconception or is there some truth into that? Well, you know, uh, Jonathan, the, uh, the, your, your comment about uh, definition of who we are as parties, right? Mm -hmm. You're absolutely right. You know, the Republicans and Democrats are usually viewed from the national view of who we are as parties, right? Right. Um, that's not my case. Uh, I am looking to reach out and help people, not because I want their vote. Yeah, mm -hmm. I want their vote, but because I care about them, mm -hmm. right? I want them to succeed, as I have succeeded. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's irrespective of their skin color. It's irrespective of where they've come from. Um, I want to make sure we have a city that provides the opportunities that are provided to me, mm -hmm. that were provided to me. And the toughest part, I can tell you, about growing up in an environment where um, people kind of looked at you and said, oh, you're going to fail, right, is getting up every time you got kicked down. Mm -hmm. And um, we have, a, a, unfortunately, as I said earlier, a system of dependency that says, oh, we'll all help you get up. Yes. We're going to hold you up, right, mm -hmm. so you won't fall again. Right. I wanted help getting up, and many people gave me a hand to get up, mm -hmm. but I wanted them to let go because right. I wasn't afraid. That, to me, is more important than the voting block. Okay. okay? And that's the problem. The problem is when we, we address something like that, it's like we're trying to use people. You know, Jonathan, I'm going to take care of you, uh -huh. all right? Yeah. Chicken in every pot, and then come election, <laughs> we're going to forget you. Right. That's not me. I said that from early on before the question came up is, is after elected, after you're sworn in, you are responsible to everyone, even people who aren't registered to vote, uh -huh. to provide for them, to help them be who they are. And, uh, and maybe, again, going back to my bringing up, I mean, you know, you, we didn't ask for anything. You know, if, if there wasn't enough food on the table, uh -huh. guess what? You ate what was on the table. You yeah. know, we didn't go get food stamps and things of that nature. Uh -huh. um, we lived within our means. Um, 
you know, maybe that's changed. But the point is, all those those assistances that have been given to us that made me who I am. I want to give back, irrespective of who you are. Mm -hmm. And um, and unfortunately, to, to your point, there's uh, this there's this national view of, oh, if you vote Republican, here's what they're going to yeah. do. They're going to cut that net down. You come off that trapeze, you're going to hit the ground. Right? Mm -hmm. That's not the case here. Okay, mm -hmm. we need to be centric. We need to be cognizant of everyone's views, and we need to work together. And Stanford is a great tapestry of all that is good about a city, bringing uh, different nationalities, different languages, different desires and needs forward. Mm -hmm. And you currently have a Republican uh, mayor now. Correct. So that gives you a lot of a belief that the city can elect a Republican yeah, mayor. Yeah, we had, uh, we had uh, that, that is correct. We've had this, and he's not the first one. I mean, we had a Republican mayor before uh, Governor Malloy was mayor. Mm -hmm. uh, we then had Governor Malloy. And uh, now we've had a, a Republican mayor. So I, I think and I hope that the citizens of our city look beyond the labels, mm -hmm. okay, and look to who the individual is and what they bring to the table, their resume, who they are as a person. Uh, and the other job as, as a candidate and as mayor is to go out there and meet people. You know, everybody mm -hmm. talks about, oh, well, we're going we're to have a, what they call a mayor's night out or mayor's night in where the mayor will go to a, a coffee shop or something and people will be able to come to that. I think that's great. But I think the mayor should be walking the streets all the time, mm -hmm. asking the questions like Mayor Ed Koch is to do. How am I doing? Right? Yes. You know, and people aren't shy about telling you. Right. Okay. Uh, I was just at a local coffee shop. I haven't, I haven't even run from, <laughs> I haven't even been elected. Uh -huh. And I had an architect come up to me and say, uh, you know, when you get elected, I want to come and talk to you about some of the designs that are going on in town and kind of the thoughts and stuff. I said, great. You know, and, and that's me. You know, I want to hear what people have to say because, as I said earlier, I don't have all the answers, nor will my administration have all the answers. So getting everyone to be involved and working with us is very important. Does Stanford have a Citizens Advisory um, Committee? Um, I don't know if that's a proper term. They do have a way to get information. But, you know, there is. if you look at technology, here's, here's the other thing about those mayor's night out. Mm -hmm. You're assuming everybody's got a car, mm -hmm. that everybody could leave their house, uh, you know, and so on, you know. That may handicap the elderly, uh -huh. who may not drive or be able to get out of the house and everything. With technology, you can have what we call these town hall meetings. And I don't know if you've ever used them, but people call into an 800 number, you dial it up, and you queue up questions. And questions come across to whomever. In this case, it'd be the mayor. Uh -huh. Mayor, here's my issue. I've got a pothole that's been sitting there for, for days. Or mayor, what's your thought on this? People don't have to leave their house to do that. Mm -hmm. People can do that right from the comfort of their home, particularly in the case of our elderly and people who, you know, husbands and wives are both working and maybe can't don't have someone to watch their children. So I want to make the the, the uh, communications inclusive. I don't want to carve anyone out of it, and uh, we're going to try a whole bunch of different things to get that communications going both ways. Okay. Well, we can have a little fun too while we're here. Okay. I, I know you like baseball, mm -hmm. and we talked. You're a Yankees fan, and I'm a Red Sox fan, so we kind of a rivalries. Mm -hmm. uh, you're good friends with Bobby Valentine, the former manager uh, yes, with the Red Sox. Yes. Yep. Um, but do you have any dreams or aspirations? I know sometimes you know you like to have certain things to enjoy yourself. Do Do you think Stanford would be a good city for a major professional sports team? You know, I, I as uh, uh, Lieutenant Governor, we you know, there's always been talk about mm -hmm. hockey teams coming back. I was yeah. in the legislature when the Patriots were entertaining coming uh, to um, to Hartford uh -huh. uh, and Rensselaer Field. You know, as much as Mike Fidelli, the individual, yeah. would love to say, yeah, you know, I, I won't have to go to Bronx to see the Yankees. Right. They can come right here to Stanford. Uh -huh. The reality is that's not going to happen. happen. You know, it's all big money. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, same thing with the Red Sox, right? Uh -huh. uh, it's money, money, money. Every move, be it a player, be it, you know, the food, be it who sells the food, how they sell their tickets, whatever, you know, who sells the concessions is all based on money. And that decision by them in Major League Baseball is not going to, you know, change that at all. On the other hand, I'd love, I'd love to see that happen. But the, the great thing is, if you look in our region, particularly Stanford, I mean, you can go to see the Bridgeport Bluefish yeah. and you see some, some guys there, Jose Canseco played up there. Uh, when he was playing for the Bluefish in the Atlantic League. You know, some of these guys that have, I won't say has-beens, but guys who uh, you normally wouldn't see. Um, uh, who's the uh, fellow with the, um, the, that has the elbow surgery, they call it, after uh, uh, 
Uh, he was the manager of the Bluefish at once. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Tommy John. Tommy John. Oh, that's right. Tommy he was John. the manager of the Bluefish. I yeah. mean, you have to see. And quite frankly, I'm you know, in those roles, they're much more approachable mm -hmm. than they are in major league uh, in, in when they're in that major league role. But you know, I've been blessed. I've been able, you know, talking about sports, I've been able to meet some really neat uh, uh, players. But also, you know, as uh, as uh, uh, lieutenant governor and stuff, I got to meet some really neat people. And actually, I got to meet the president a number of times. Mm -hmm. um, we got to meet the pope when. Uh, he came to Washington. Uh, I got to uh, meet the first uh, black man who landed on the moon. Uh, you know, really neat folks. And the neatest thing that I did as a, as a young man when I used to look at television in black and white with only three channels, and you look at these people and say, are they real? Are, you know, are they touchable people? Mm -hmm. They are. And you know what? They put their pants on just like we do. Yes. They're really, really interesting people who really care about who we are as people. Mm -hmm. And that kind of represents your own self. You know, you were a lieutenant governor, but you're still in touch with yep. the everyday person. Mm -hmm. And I think that's important. Well, you can never forget where you came from, because if you get where you came from, you're going to lose your way going forward. Mm -hmm. So obviously you're looking forward to running this election. Has it officially been announced that you're running for me? Well, we announced uh, around February 25th. We filed all our papers, so we are official. Uh, this Saturday, April 20th at... Uh, Two o'clock. Doors open at one thirty at the University of Connecticut downtown. We're going to have our what I'll call the big balloon and confetti announcement, where uh, we'll have uh, about two to three hundred people there uh, announcing you know, some of my who I am, my vision, uh, and we're looking for a, 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 that's I guess our official kickoff. We just had our first uh, fundraising quarter, uh -huh. uh, and in four weeks we raised close to one hundred fifty thousand uh -huh. dollars. The good news about that is we not only did we do it in four weeks, but seventy two percent of that was from all local folks. Okay, uh, most of my uh, opponents raised twenty five thousand, fifteen thousand. Uh, one opponent did raise a little bit over a hundred thousand, but uh, most of their money came from out of state. So the local support uh, and the money in the short time is is, uh, is exciting because I feel that someone gives you a dollar. Uh, they're a shareholder in your success, and uh, I've got a lot of shareholders in that right now. Mm -hmm. And you feel very confident the way that this election is going into um, I, I feel I feel good about it. I'm not confident oh, okay. uh, until election night, and they, they say we've won, right? Uh, I've been in this business. I've won some. I've lost some. And you see, that's part about falling down. I don't do this because it's a career. I do this because I have something to lend. And so that's going to make me make decisions that may jeopardize where I'm going to go, but I'm not afraid to do that because I want to make decisions as mayor mm -hmm. that are good for the next generation, not just for the next election. And the challenge we have in government today is we have too many people in office that are making decisions based on the next election right? instead of the next generation. Next generation, yes. Well, we're running pretty much, we still have a little bit of time left. Is there anything else that you would like to leave to the Internet Airways about, you know, your life and, you know, something that many people might not be aware of? about Michael Fidelli? Um, you know, the old thing, what you see is what you get. Uh -huh. um, you know, there are folks that have different perceptions about because of the titles that I've had and, and who I am today. But I'm really, you know, as, as I said earlier, I put my pants on the same way. I'm not afraid to engage. Um, we may not always agree on decisions, but, you know, I really, I've really thought it through. Uh, I'm doing this because it's very important to me. I want the same opportunities for our citizens in Stanford and their children and their grandchildren as my children uh, had and I had and my grandchildren. I just became a grandfather oh, okay. three times over. Three we times. Had, yeah, I had three boys and one time. I want those opportunities there for them because this is a great city, it's a great state, it's a great nation and people need to be aware of those opportunities and not be afraid to go after them. And that's part of your uh, legacy that you would like to leave uh, behind. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, my son uh, asked me once when I became lieutenant governor, you know, how would I like to be remembered, which I thought was a pretty interesting question. And I said to him, he said, you know what, I'd, how I'd like to be remembered? If you're walking down the street one day with my grandson and if someone stops you and says, who is your dad? And they and you say, uh, Michael Fideli. And that person says, what a nice guy he was. Then I fit the ball out of the park. Mm -hmm. and, and that's, that's important a, to you. That's very important. Okay, uh, Michael Fideli, I enjoyed this conversation that we had. Uh, I appreciate you. the fact that you drove an hour plus to get here uh, this morning. Uh, and you seem like a person that I hope to meet again in the very uh, near future. And hopefully people can decide that this is the right candidate that they want to vote for. 
Again, this is Jonathan Small, uh, host of All About You. I, again, do this program every single week. Uh, I recommend everybody out there to tune in to AccessTV.org network. We have a lot of other good shows that's very informative on this network besides this show. Uh, we all try to complement each show. Uh, we want this network to grow. I feel it's going in the right direction. It could always improve. I could always improve. And I, I think it's very important that people stay informed. And this network is giving people the ability to tune into this show anywhere throughout the world. I thank my executive producer and technical du uh, director for putting this format uh, together. And, you know, as I say every single week, until the next time, everybody have a blessed day and keep the faith. Thank you. Hey. Hey. Hey.